Hello, everybody. How is everybody doing? Hey. Oh, Bane and Chiad, what's up? What's going on? So uh, just going to give a quick a couple seconds, make sure you can all hear us in chat. Uh, just give me a shout out if anything sounds terrible because I'm horrible at my job. And That and is a lie. You're doing great, Tom. I'm the worst. It's okay. You can be honest. She, she reprimands me all the time. Well, yeah, in private. It's true. It's true. It is in private. It is. In public, you are perfect. And <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming to join us today. Uh, obviously, we are Dragon Mount, and this is a special edition of my usual Saturday Live. As you can see, I am joined by the lovely and amazing executive producer, Magical Unicorn Kathy, above me over here. And there's this, like, very weird kind of blank space in this area. I don't know. Maybe someone special should be coming in there. I don't know. Are you guys, do you want to? Oh my God, look, it's ah! Ray Jenkins. Oh my God. <laughs> what a surprise. Guys, that, that paper reveal was flawlessly pulled off. <laughs> I, I am super professional at this. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> it's good. It's good. It's good. Thank you so much for being here, Ray. We're so excited. No, I'm so happy to get to talk to you guys. It's so good to see you. Yay. And I thank you for uh, answering those questions when we were doing that rewatch stuff. That was a ton of fun. Yeah. Oh, no, it was really fun. It's just, you know, like, it's always great when people are able to go back and, and watch through it. And there's so many, so many thousands of things that we've thought about and done. That we had fun because we're in the writer's room for season three right now in London. And so a couple of them, too, I, like, took back into the writer's room and was like, guys, what were we thinking on this one? Remember what we did with this? Can we tell them this? No, we can't. We, you know. <laughs> Oh, I love that you, I love that you tried though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. Uh, all right. Shall we get started? Let's go. Yeah. yeah go right go. in. So, so we got you in the hot seat now. So right. we, 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 we're going to like, we, 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 we got to ask the hard hitting, you know, right down to the meat of it questions. That's how interviews start straight <laughs> off the bat. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so, so right off the bat, what is your favorite dinosaur? My favorite dinosaur has always been the um, Pachycephalosaurus. Ooh, <laughs> nice! And what a fun name to say! That I think that's yeah, I was my like, favorite I don't, dinosaurs. I know how to spell it. Do I know how to say it out loud? I'm not... <laughs> you know how to spell that? There's way too many repeat letters in that for my Lisdexia to, to keep up with. It'll be <laughs> all right. So now that we've gotten that off. Yep. bat we're gonna probably <laughs> get waffled but we're gonna you know what we're gonna we're gonna try um there could be yeah there could be a fair amount of that we haven't been able to do like a an interview with the like people who really know the really know this stuff um yeah. for a while so if, if i hate you with too many waffles then no. i apologize in that's fine not. And, you won't, and by you... the way thank you so much for doing this live with us I, we like we know this is not oh, something you do normally almost ever so thank you no, great. We finished uh, Ready Room yesterday, so for the first time in a while, Ooh. like a day off. It's nice. That's exciting, it's and you're holidays. spending it working. We, yeah. we well, really appreciate it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I know you probably won't tell me to have an affair with a German Shepherd, so I'm going to use this right now. We'll okay? that. We saw a recent report from Delhi Comic Con suggesting season two would be premiering in early 2023. Yeah. Is there any truth to that? Um, I can say that there. <laughs> There's some truth to it in that I do believe season two will pre be premiering in 2023. I think early, there's still a lot of work that we've got to do on the show uh, in post, VFX, all of that. So I would I would not expect it in early 2023, but you can't expect it in 2023. Excellent. Oh, that's good because uh, I'm really excited. I can't wait. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. I feel like every month we'll be we'll be actively shooting an episode, and they're like, "There's a spoiler online that it's coming out next week," and you're like, "We're we we haven't shot We're it. Still it's filming. Awesome. <laughs> We're still filming." We're still filming. And uh, if there's speaking of releasing and television shows for Amazon, uh, I feel like if I don't ask this, we may get harangued endlessly in chat. So <laughs> it was also recently reported that you are going to be heading as another showrunner for a recently picked up series. I believe it's called uh, God of War, maybe? It Some people might be. Yes. 
Yeah, well, it's funny for me. I mean, this is something I've been working on for a long time with Mark and Hawk. And so um, the announcement just came out, but it's something that we've known about and been involved with for a while. So it's like, you know, it's... Um, it's really exciting. I love the games. Um, I love working with those two guys. They're great, really smart. I love The Expanse. I'm sure many others are fans as well. Um, Iron Man, also a good film. Don't know if you've seen it. <laughs> yeah. oh, um, I've heard about once or, that. Once or twice, I think, yeah. I mean, years ago. No, so it's great. It's, it's a really, um, it's just a really fun project to work on. And I've always worked on other stuff while I'm working on Wheel, so it'll never affect like my commitment to Wheel, um, obviously, but it's, uh, it's something that I'm really happy to be working on because I really love it. And it's also really different than Wheel in a lot of ways. So it's yeah. it's a good balance to do between the two. Do you think there's anything that you can take that you learned or experienced in Wheel of Time over to that show in any way or? Yeah, so much. I mean, you know, that it, it's a very different project and medium to adapt. So in a lot of ways, things are very different than adapting something like Wheel of Time, but especially from a production perspective, like we've just learned so much and, you know, the world, when we first started filming Wheel of Time, you know, it was kind of only Game of Thrones that had tempted something so large before. And so now there's so many shows that are doing it. I've gotten to know a lot of the showrunners of those as well. There's so many really smart women and men who are, are doing this and figuring out how to put these things together. And so um, I think if anything, I've learned a lot about the production aspect of it that will, I think, be useful in going into God of War and also flick back into Wheel of Time, hopefully, of like things that we can find out about that. Because, you know, the fun thing about making film and TV is that it's always changing and there's always new technology, new cameras, new new things that you can use to bring these worlds to life. So um, so it's it's fun. It's fun to be able to do both. Kind of like that bolt camera that you used for the... Yeah, exactly. Like the things that you, you know... Um... Oh, I was going to say something that I definitely can't say. <laughs> <laughs> I swear that's not our goal. I promise. No, no, no. Uh, I'll be careful. I, I, you know, I have to twist my words a lot. It's a, yeah. You know, it's yeah, I'm sure. Stuff. I'm sure you're used to it. I've, I've sworn yeah. way more than three oaths to Amazon, though. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we. So we have. We're doing just that with with season two and three now, I can say at least, where we have some fun new kinds of technologies coming. Excellent. Cool. Can't wait to hear about it. Uh, along those same lines of lessons, Sean was wondering, uh, what major lesson did you learn that you took from season one that helped inform your process or the structure or the setup or anything for season two? Yeah, I think season one coming in, uh, we had a very clear plan of doing a longer season to tackle that and had to compress it. Um, and so going into season two, you know, it, we tried to be, obviously I have my long-term plan for the show. And so that all shifts with eight episodes instead of 10 episodes, but going into season two with more foreknowledge of how long it would be, we were able to try to figure out ways to get longer episodes in, you know, figure out how to get more of the story that we need to tell. Cause we have, you know, if we had a lot of story to tell in season one, we have a massive amount of story to tell in season two. It's, you know, it only gets bigger. Shattering at times. Um, and so I think a big lesson we learned was being able to approach it from the beginning like that. And, and in some cases, you know, changing the story more in order to be able to get through the whole story more effectively. So it's, it's kind of a counterintuitive thing where I, I feel like sometimes we can actually pull off some of the story, story pieces and, and delivering on things from the books more effectively if we don't try to hit every single tiny beat of it because um, the adaptation we're doing is just at a different scale than other things in terms of like the amount of page, you know, we're trying to do, if we get our whole series, we're doing like, 200 pages an episode versus Game of Thrones 50 pages an episode. Right. You have to sort of like, it's a little more, uh, I know this will, is, people are probably shaking and dying in the chat right now, but like <laughs> there's, there's more remixing kind of sometimes to, to be able to deliver the story overall so that you kind of get to, you know. I, I imagine it like a jigsaw puzzle that you're kind of making as you go. 
<laughs> well, and a piece of it too is like, you know, for season two, especially one of the first things, Brandon, I think I can say all this. Oh, well, I'm going to, sorry. <laughs> um, but when I first talked to Brandon uh, Sanderson about the show um, and my worries about the overall adaptation, I was like, you know, one thing I'm thinking about is that books two and three both have the same narrative arc, essentially, of landing with Rand in a confrontation from a man who will come to realize this is Shamael. And like, how do we, you you can't do that in television two seasons in a row because that doesn't work in that context. And he said the same thing of like, you know, you have to combine those two, even though there's these incredible stories that are in both of those books. If you told them sequentially like that, it would sort of break it down, which was his same instinct as well. Um, and so I think one of the big challenges we face with season two is it's sort of like, you know, I think you'll feel this when you watch it is almost like we throw up some of the juggling balls at the end of season one, where it's like, okay, here's a bunch of pieces that we've put in play. This is the foundation here. All the pieces go up. And by the end of season two, you'll see them start to all land in places that set up the shadow rising. But a lot of those are taking different paths than, than you might have anticipated from the books because we can't tell those two books sequentially. Even though I love the stories in both of them and they're really strong stories, you just structurally can't do that. Of course. And the, the best part about that is, is like we get to go on this journey through the Wheel of Time again where we thought we were never going to get any more content. And uh, uh, it's like, for, for especially for someone who's been in the, you know, reading it for like 20 years, it's like, ah, new Wheel of Time content yeah. that I get to be surprised by. Yeah. Um, so the next question was submitted by an anonymous user, but it is a great question. Uh, the diversity in the writer's room and behind the camera with the crew has been praised by the community. Has the diversity perspective enriched the show's production in any way that you'd like to share? I mean, in so many different ways, like, and I, you know, I always think of diversity as like, a much larger category than than how it's sometimes talked about in online communities of like, you know, it, when I'm putting together the writer's room, I'm thinking about people who also have diversity of thought, who are, you know, like, are they comedy writers? Are they, um, you know, people who are really good with structure and investigative beats? That, that kind of thing we're also putting into it. Um, and one thing that was important to us, especially first season was sort of like, you know, a lot of Western cultures have, do not believe in reincarnation. So it's not something that's like ingrained in us from the beginning. So a big thing I was always trying to do with the writer's room was like, get us in the headspace of our characters who all believe in reincarnation. And it's just like a fundamental piece of their life. Um, and so we had a writer on the show, Celine Song, who grew up in Korea. Um, and she was very helpful sometimes of being like, oh, you know, like my family believes in reincarnation like everyone I know does. And this is how it sort of filters into our daily life as opposed to just like the, uh, you know, bigger. the big ideas of the mythology of it. It's like, what do you what do you think when someone yells at you? Like, and how does you do your beliefs? How are they affected? And how are your interpersonal relationships affected by that? So she was really helpful, for instance, with the Randon and Gwen storyline of like, you know, they have this idea of um, souls kind of brushing across each other in lives and that like sometimes you'll have a very strong relationship with someone and you know that it's not going to be for this life. Sorry, spoiler alert for anyone who's in this chat <laughs> who doesn't know the Wheel of Time. I, I, I don't know how we're, you're we're, fu we're, we're, we're full book spoilers. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you're there. Um, but, you know, like those two characters won't be together in this life. And so that idea of like, you have to build a certain number of brushes in your life before you're in your past lives before you're ready to be with someone. And that like philosophically, we could think of Randon and Gwen's relationship as like one of those brushes on their way to being together in a future life. And so that kind of stuff from like um, a writer's room that has a strong diversity of thought and culture and um, backgrounds, it, it, it can really bring a lot to the show. And I think it has to ours. I agree. 
Absolutely. Um, so along those same lines, we see several ritualistic, almost religious like practices on screen, step in burning incense to ward off the forsaken as well as land pr praying in episode four. What is the thought process for expanding this on screen when in the written work, there's far less a portrayal of an organized religion? Yeah, and we kept that very like, clear always with the production design team and, and with the story team is that there is no organized religion in the wheel of time. However, there are very strong cultures in the wheel of time. And what are some of the ways that we could see those, those cultural practices come into play? Um, and so, you know, you see them in a lot of the, the scenes too, there'll be like, like little, little, we call them like, <laughs> sort of like, ritual stories on screen where there's like something in the background of a scene that sort of suggests this backstory of culture for a place and a history of life there. Um, and I do think those are in the books, like even the Maypoles in Two Rivers, like there's so many examples of this that are sort of like these pseudo ritualistic, you know, pseudo religious ritualistic things that happen. Um, and so I think trying to find ways to bring those into the show was really important for us and see you know, create a world where for people who don't know the books at all, they're able to subconsciously and subtly take in the idea. You know, you ask most people who don't read the books about religion in the show and they're like, I don't think there is a religion, but like people come from different places and you can see that they care about those things. Like that scene with Lan and Stepin, you can, we don't say it, but you can tell from how it goes that this is not something that Lan does, but it is something that Stepin does. And so they must have different upbringings and different places that they come from. So we, there's a lot of like that subconscious world building that we're trying to do too with the, with not just the way we wrote it, but the way that it's produced so that, um, you know, the things that you take in with the many, many pages of information about this in the books, like we can feed those things subtly through the show so that actually, you know, an audience who knows nothing about the books has built that foundation in their brain for how this world works, even though we've never had a scene about it. Yeah. I like that. Uh, and, uh, and coming, uh, having spoken to a few people that haven't read the books and have watched, have only watched the show. I think that that comes through pretty strong because they've, they've said they've picked up on some themes that you would really only be able to get from reading the books, but from, you know, just watching the show. And, and I, and I think that does come through pretty strong. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so uh, our next one is from another community member. This one uh, is, a, this one should be a little bit easier for you. Um, and it's only, it's great. I know. I, <laughs> the, uh, uh, so, so only taking into account the books, having no impact on the show whatsoever, just, you know, your, uh, your love of the books. Uh, is there any particular, and this is from, oh, they didn't write their name. Uh, uh, are there any particular minor characters that you're passionate about? Oh, I mean, I I really like Pavara. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, she may find her way into the show. Also, Brandon does too. You know, like there's That's a couple of those characters. There's some of the Aes Sedai characters that I... I'm just like unduly obsessed with and some of the wise ones um, as well um, that you just like, they end up bleeding their way. If I think actually the fans of the books would be, it would be so wild for them to hear the writer's room talk about some of these characters because <laughs> there's truly like, cause we have a very big mix also of people who know the books versus don't know the books who versus have read some of the books um, is, uh, that it's it's <laughs> it's like the level of detail that people know these characters like everyone in this writer's room some of them who had never heard of the books before coming to this show know every name of leandrin's black aja cabal and <laughs> they're you know i mean there are we call her genie kadi that's not how you'd pronounce her names from the books but like <laughs> the love for genie kadi in the room is wild and the <laughs> amount of time that is spent talking about her versus Chesmol versus Ispan versus Rihanna like everyone knows all of them and all of their character traits in a way that I think would shock people 
<laughs> oh my gosh, I, I can't wait to hear it being spoken about more publicly when the show is over and have, you know, some more behind the scenes interviews and discussions and, and just see the love that I can just feel yeah. that the writer's room has. I love yeah. that. Um, okay, so when you pitched The Wheel of Time, at the time, like you mentioned earlier, Game of Thrones was pretty much the main fantasy series. Um, and you were really strongly believing, you know, Wheel of Time is very matriarchal, very female forward in a world that didn't have a lot of that going on right now. Now that we have more high fantasy and more high fantasy that has these strong female characters, how do you feel Wheel of Time fits into that relevance of the whole world that's now becoming more relevant in uh, society? Well, I think the great thing about the Wheel of Time and when I pitched it, you know, because people have tried to make Wheel of Time TV shows and movies before, um, but the way that I pitched it and, and saw it coming in was really that, you know, at that time in my career, I was being approached to do a lot of these big projects because um, of the pieces I'd done previously in TV and features. And so, you know, what I felt when I was reading and looking at a lot of them was that they were chasing something. Mm -hmm. um, and I, my pitch was that Wheel of Time is chasing nothing. Wheel of Time is its own entity and that it is what other things have been chasing for a long time. And that if you if you really stick to what it is, and we'll always lean into the pieces of it that feel fresher today, we have to, like that's just part of the adaptation that we're doing um, and that won't change. But that Wheel of it, Time itself is, is not chasing Game of Thrones. It is not chasing Lord of the Rings. It is something that exists on its own and other things will chase it someday and are now even. Like people talk yeah. about Wheel of Time as a comp for things that they're trying to make because of the success the show's had. Um, and I think also that just in the way Wheel of Time, it's not, Wheel of Time is not just about women either. It's about um, sort of gender and balance in the world. Um, and I actually think those messages still feel very fresh and very interesting today. And that like, there's a lot of pockets within that, that Robert Jordan opened that the books don't fully go into, but that we can look at in the show and that, that can be things that we develop further. So I think it's just as fresh and relevant today as it was when I pitched it, which is, you know, like four or five years ago now. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's, I think at its core, it, it is because it's not chasing because it's, it's sort of driving its own path. Yeah. Okay. So since we, since we mentioned other attempts, there's a lot of Billy Zane love going on in chat right now. Um, mm. uh, another, <laughs> another question from the, uh, from uh, user submitted was uh, from Katie. She wanted to know if you could share any fun stories from filming on season one or season two, like, you know, behind the scenes, like, oh, so-and-so did this or whatever. Oh my God, there's so many crazy things. We did do, um, I think I can talk about this, Joanna, maybe. Um, we, uh, <laughs> Joanna can yell at you in the, in the did, chat. If... <laughs> we did, so when, uh, when Rosamund won her Golden Globe for I Care A Lot, we presented it to her on set um, and did, like, so we had this scene, it was a scene in Faldara where, uh, you know, it was like that core group of seven were together. Um, and so we had, I, we did it because I like pranks and the Golden, <laughs> Globes, the Golden Globes people had contacted my office to see what to do with her Golden Globe. And I was like, send it to me. I've got a plan. <laughs> and Fantastic. so we sent it. We, they do this whole thing, you know, where she's basically does one of her classic Moraine, like, we leave it dawn, you know, and then storms out of the room. And so she's supposed to do that. And it's all set up and we're shooting the first shot of the scene and she's doing her beautiful speech. And then she goes to, we leave it dawn. And then Lan doesn't go with her because in his bag is the golden globe. And then she is trying to stay in character as Moraine and convince Lan to come with her and then he instead presents her with the golden globe <laughs> oh my god that's fantastic i love daniel oh, so amazing. much so fun okay bridget from the community would like to know what w-o-t i just had to <laughs> clarify what if any fan theories about the show have left you completely flabbergasted 
Oh my God. There's so, we, I sadly, and I really wish I did have more time to engage. I'm so, so busy making the show that I don't get to read a lot of the stuff online. So what I do here is like, it'll come into our writer's room group chat or like people will throw in and they'll be like, did you know that the fans think X? And we're like, oh, here's the other thing is sometimes it's very correct where we're like, they're like they've picked up on something so, so, so tiny, but that we've set in place that we're going to pay off in like season three. Um, I'm trying to think of any of the ones that I thought were particularly hilarious because there were, there were so many really good ones for season one, but it was a long time ago now. And I'm trying to remember any of the ones that we had like a real crack up about. I mean, uh, Bella. Bella's the creator is always a good one. Well, that, I mean, we have, so we have the book ban- fan theories and those we love and try to do not <laughs> to in the show. But there's also, I was thinking of like the crazy show fan theories mm-hmm. that they have. And also the people who um, don't know the books, but have theories about what's going to happen in the show. Some of those are, those I don't are know if you look at those, but they're yes. like, if I ever have time to read the internet, I am reading exclusively those because they're <laughs> So, hilarious. so interesting. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> so I gave you no answers to your question. And it's, it's fine. That was, that was a ton of fun. <laughs> you know, we don't have specifics, but we know that they exist. So keep those fan theories coming and entertain yeah. our writers. Yeah. Entertain <laughs> the writers at the very least. Yes. Yeah. Speaking uh, of entertaining the writers. <laughs> <Tom. laughs> yeah. Um, have you, so, so uh, James submitted, uh, d- do you um sorry? Do you share any of the memes and gifs that or gifs that uh that the fans have created amongst yourselves? Uh yes, we definitely do. A lot of <laughs> there's a lot of water and shade in the office. There's a lot of we we really we really love, especially there's like a special love for the intersection of drag queen culture and wheel of time memes mm-hmm. that that we really get behind. Um and there's one one of our writers, Justine Gilmer, does she, her her gift work isn't like is like on an Oscar worthy level. Like what any writer on the show would tell you that one of Ju- Justine's most significant characteristics is her ability to in nanoseconds deliver the perfect gift. And she has a lot of uh Wheel of Time ones. She has like, you know, the Moraine turning around to look at Rand after he says no to her is <laughs> Uh, is a very effective <laughs> gif in chat. So <laughs> he, if you want, get Justine on here and she will give you instantaneous, perfect gif work. I love it. Uh, I, love I think it. the answer is yes, we do want her here. So I mean, feel yeah. free yeah, anytime, any moment, we will work around her. <laughs> okay, so as you've mentioned previously, you don't have a lot of time for the internet, but I'm guessing you have some free time sometimes, occasionally, maybe <laughs> just a couple minutes. Um, what media are you consuming? Are you watching any TV shows, playing video games, cooking, knitting sweaters? How do you unwind? Um, how do I unwind is a good question. So, <laughs> I don't get too many moments of downtime. We do, <laughs> we do, you know, sometimes it's funny because in some ways, like I try to watch a lot of other shows, obviously, that are like this show or that are, you know, doing interesting things that I think are interesting in television and film. Um, you know, like I, I, even though I have literally no time, I've still watched everywhere, um, everything everywhere all at once. Like, oh, yes. Three times. This year, so there, you know, there's things that you have to find. But when I sometimes I just need my brain to like shut down and not be doing anything whatsoever. Um, and I watched this show in the UK called Taskmaster. I don't know. <gasps> yes. I'm obsessed oh with it right now. I'm I just finished season five today. Oh so if God. I ever get a spare moment right now in my life for the last couple months, because I, I get to watch like one episode of Taskmaster a week, but that is, you know, that is my special rave time is just watching Taskmaster. Oh, that's great. Amazing choice. Such I gotta watch show. it now. Oh, it's so good, Tom. <laughs> it's great. You'll love it. So uh, we're, we're, we're getting d- down toward the end of our interview right now, but we have, we have a lot of fun questions that, that we wanted to get to from the community. Uh, Rapunzel, since you brought up being uh, pr- pr- particularly liking pranks before, Rapunzel asked, uh, are there any fun ones that you can share and uh, have any come close to Maureen and Suan's level? 
And no is a I'm perfectly trying, acceptable answer. I'm trying to think of any of them that I can share because <laughs> yeah. we, we, we have a lot of them. Um, oh, what can I share? <laughs> oh, I'm I think the fact that you have to go through the Rolodex of pranks in your head to figure out which ones are shareable is, a lot is, is funny. Excellent, excellent Wheel of Time pranks. One that I did, this was awful, actually. I felt terrible about it afterwards. <laughs> But when we wrapped on season two, and it had been such, um, just like such, uh, or wrapped on season one, sorry, such a hard shoot on everyone because it was during COVID and like we were back and forth and we were all like f literally forced to like live alone in rooms in our place, just alone all the time so that we wouldn't bring, you know, me and the cast um, and like the director and writer so that we wouldn't bring COVID to the set. So it was like very, very emotionally hard. Um, and at the end of the season, we, when we wrapped, we had a party and like, we had not seen each other socially for a long time. And Yosha had asked me if he could shave his head because we had a plan. You've seen images from season two. Um, and because Yosha likes to wear his head hair shaved. And so he shaved it and came to the party and then he got there and we did a whole prank where AK, one of the other producers on the show, texted Yosha saying, I'm trying to get hold of Rafe. We have to do one more scene tomorrow with you. Hair and makeup's already gone home. And like did this whole prank about him having to shoot another scene and we didn't have a hair and makeup team for his hair. <laughs> and then I found this sweet, sweet, sweet man that Yosha is in the other room talking to his agent being like, I think I have to change my flight home because I'm shooting this scene tomorrow and Rafe's going to do my hair and makeup. <laughs> like it was <laughs> such chaos. And uh, it, so it made me sad, but it was, a, it was, it was a pretty good prank. I'm still waiting to be got back for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very smart to keep you waiting because that anticipation and you're always on ready. I never waiting. see you so and don't have a slight bit of tension in mm -hmm. my soul that he's about to get me back for that horrible prank. <laughs> It was Which really sure is okay. totally he's, healthy. He's the queen of pranks. So he maybe he's going after her for it instead. Okay. <laughs> okay. Giada would like to know if you could help give the Wheel of Time fandom an official name. What would you call us? I mean, I feel like, is it because we're moving away from Twitter? Twitter of Time, I feel like, has been a nice name for the fandom. And I don't know if you guys know this, but like they do... Um, they do like, you know, these sort of like statistics on different fandoms for big projects like this. Um, and the Wheel of Time fandom is statistically the best fandom. <laughs> we have proof, scientific yeah. proof. <laughs> like in terms of being kind and positive, like for our show, um, I know there's the crazies, but like it's something like 70% of people who've read all 14 books think the show is as good or better than the books, which is a crazy number. Um, I, it's not a lot of the online community necessarily who interact with it, but like of the wider world of people who, you know, love Wheel of Time, like consistently statistically Wheel of Time will come in and like deliver that it's like the nicest, the most welcoming, like, all of these things. It's a really, it's a really beautiful fandom. So we should come up with like a perfect name for it. Yeah. Put your right. You know, you just wrapped writing. So <laughs> well, not all that we the holidays and then we yeah. have yeah, Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, we don't want to get in trouble with any unions. No. Uh, so we have to end on a, on, on one fun note. So the, yeah. the very last should be easy for you. Uh, what is your favorite wheel of time curse word? Oh, um, well, it's not a curse word, but I'm obsessed when Lanfra calls anyone a milk-haired <laughs> pale, pale haired milk sop. I love that. Oh my God, that's that is so pale good. Haired. That's fantastic. Well, you've heard it here, folks. Pale haired <laughs> milk, milk sop. Uh, well, thank you so much, Rafe, for coming yeah. and hanging out with us. And thank Amazon for allowing you to come in here. And, you know, I'm sure you could beat them into submission. No, no, they, it's very, it's very nice that they let me do it. I, I, it's great that we have the time to do it. It's so nice Absolutely. to see you guys. Uh, make sure to like, subscribe, hit the share button, no notification bell, and I will see you guys on Monday for episode one of the rewatch of Rings of Power. See you around. Bye.